Hi, this lecture is on the Cayley graph of the ideal class group. It's a part of the Isogeny-based cryptography summer school of Bristol 2021. The class notes are available in the link in the comment section. Comment section. So what is the purpose of looking at the Cayley graph? So we're going to first describe what that Cayley graph is for any group. And then we are going to analyze first what's, what, how does it correspond to the interesting uh, computational problems in the class group. And then we will see how um, um, those problems can be made easier when we know certain crucial properties of the class group that make its scaly graph, uh, well, that gives its scaly graph rapid mixing properties. So a Cayley graph is defined by a group. So a group G, a group G uh, uh, makes the vertices. Okay. So typically we're looking at finite groups, and the elements uh, of the elements of G are the vertices, and we're looking at a subset of G that generates it. We call it S. Okay. So here we label S by S1, S2 uh, until S, uh, SK. And we make the crucial, uh, the crucial assumption that as the S generates the group G. We put an edge between two elements, G1 and G2, if and only if there is an S in S such that G1 is equal to S times G2. Okay? Now, what does it look like in terms of graph? Well, let's say we, we look at a node, I mean, look at a vertex that is made of an element G, I mean, a response to the element G in G. And then let's say S is, in this case, made of S1, S2, and S3. Then when we, uh, who is connected to G is S1 times G, S2 times G, and S3 times G. And then the, the elements that are connected to those uh, other elements, they could be viewed as uh, S2, well, S1, S2, G, S2, 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 G, S3, S2, G. Of course, sometimes this can loop back. So this is, um, uh, well, th this might, you yeah, know, there might be a little cycle here, but in general, this is what it looks like. And you can iterate this process and that constructs a graph, okay? Now, um, so that is for a generic group. Now, what could it look like in the ideal class group? Okay. So first, you need a you need a generating set S for the group that you're considering. So we've seen before that under a generalization of the Riemann hypothesis, the classes of the P's of norm less than 12 log squared delta would generate the ideal class group. Now it turns out given uh, that we're looking for uh, proving some rapid mixing properties, so which is more than just a mere connectivity of the graph, we need to find a slightly large, we need to use a slightly larger uh, uh, set of, of elements. So the, the, the elements that we'll consider for the, the Cayley graph of the class group are the, the class of the prime ideals of norm up to log square, I mean, log to the power 2 plus a little bit of something, so plus an epsilon, a constant epsilon of delta, <clears throat> and their inverses, okay? So that is our typical choice, and that's because we'll need uh, such a large, slightly larger set in order to prove the properties we want uh, with the Cayley graph of the class group. Now, what are the interesting problems? First, one of the pro one of the computational problems that we're interested in when it comes to class groups is finding relations between the generators. So finding vectors x and z such that the product of the pi to the xi or the pi to the generators, okay, so the split prime ideals p1, p2 until pk, uh, are equal to a, uh, uh, a principal ideal. So what it means is this product here of the pi's to the xi, this is the same, this is a neutral element. That is what we're saying here in terms of ideal classes. In this, so the search, so the search for such vectors is really connected to the calculation of the structure of the class group. Turns out finding those vectors is the same as finding cycles in the Cayley graph of the class group. 
Now, some cycles are very easy to find because we've put all the primes and their inverses. So, well, what happens is I can go backwards easily and that's a cycle, right? So I multiply by P, I multiply by the inverse, uh, that's a cycle. So these trivial cycles are required to calculate the class group, but the non-trivial ones are kind of hard to find. Now, there is another problem uh, very relevant to um, uh, uh, very relevant to isogeny evaluation. Uh, the reason is because we can uh, evaluate isogenies through the action of an ideal on uh, in the case of ordinary elliptic curves, and and, and so it it turns out when those ideals have large norm, the, this kind of evaluation is hard. But if you're able to find an x such that you can rewrite an ideal A of potentially large norm as a product of ideals PIs of polynomial norm, then the evaluation of the, the isogeny that corresponds to this, and I'm intentionally not getting into details because this will be covered by different lecturers in the summer school, but basically the takeaway here is that it makes that evaluation of the action of those ideals easier because then instead of a large norm ideal we're looking at these actions of of of, of the the ideals that are in the product okay so the the pis they're all of small norm and their action is easy to compute so it's a very it's a very interesting task to be able to break down in the ideal class group an input ideal a of large norm with respect to, uh, as a product of ideals of small norm. And that, in terms of walks in the class group, is the finding of a path between that uh, the class of that input ideal and the trivial class uh, of, the, uh, of the class group, so the class of principal ideals. Now, in general, uh, writing, uh, you know, in general, this is the problem of finding a path between two given nodes, two given vertices in the Cayley graph. So these are kind of like the two main uh, computational problems uh, that we're interested in the scope of, of causal computation is that justify the study of uh, the, the mixing properties uh, of the Cayley graph of the class group. Now those properties they will uh, they will come from uh, the adjacency operator so uh, we will need to define that first and see how it's connected to mixing properties of just about any KV graph, not necessarily the class group. So first off, uh, we notice, and, and that is completely trivial from the definition, that it's K regular. There's always, for any given nodes, there's always K, uh, for every given vertex, there's always K different outcoming uh, um, edges from, uh, uh, that correspond to the multiplication by every element in S. Now, the adjacency operator it's it takes so it's an operator that takes functions on the graph so let's say f is a function on your graph and a is the operator a uh, a acting on f acts by producing another function on the graph and that function is defined by a f of x is the sum of f of y for every y that has an edge with x okay so it's defined from f and, and that's our adjacency operator, okay? So, it, so the operator itself acts on functions and it produces another function. Now, first property that we need to insist on is the fact that there are eigenfunctions, and in particular, the, the, the most easy to find is the eigenfunction, which is the constant function equals to one, okay? Or any constant function, as a matter of fact. But let's look at the one that is defined by one of x equals one, but if you apply the adjacency operator, you'll notice that it's, it satisfies a1 equals k, where k is uh, the um, uh, cardinality of s. So this is an eigenfunction for this uh, eigenvalue that we will call lambda triv for, because we say it's a trivial eigenvalue. Now, it turns out all other eigenvalues and absolute value are less than this lambda trivial, okay? So, uh, we know for sure about one of them, and the question is, what do the others look like? So now, but most importantly, what does it have to do? What does it have to do with random walks in the Cayley graph of a group? Well, assume 
that you have a k regular, uh, so k regular k Lie graph uh, of a group G, and then let S0 be any subset of vertices of our graph, okay? Now, there are two different things that we want, really. We want, so we want that traveling from A to B in, in, the, in the graph, uh, could, uh, that it be done by, by short paths, okay? That's one thing. The other thing is that we want that random walks land almost uniformly at random in the graph, okay? So these two things, uh, we would like to uh, uh, ensure, okay, and this theorem can help us depending on the eigenvalues of the adjacency operator. So more specifically, assume that we have this. So assume that we have that all the non-trivial eigenvalues have their absolute value, uh, so have the absolute value bounded by some C, which itself is strictly less than the value of the trivial eigenvalue. Then for a t uh, that is greater than this value, let's let's uh, see what happens first with that t and discuss its value. Then a random walk of length at t lands in an S0, so the S0 that we just said, the subset of the vertices, with probability that is almost the uniform probability. So it's between one half and three halves of the uniform probability of landing in S0, okay? Now, uh, what does that mean? So we would like this to be exactly uniform probability. Uh, that would be amazing. Now, um, uh, what's also important is we want t to be small. Okay, so the, the smaller t is, the better it will be for all the algorithmic problems that I mentioned before. Now, the numerator of t is made of log terms, so log of g, so essentially bounded by log of g, okay, log 2g, so we, which is an perfectly acceptable value. It's a polynomial, a polynomial value. But what's more concerning is what's in the denominator. So see, here you have the quotient of k by c. So you're hoping that c be significantly larger than k in order for this thing to be large enough. Indeed, if c is too close to k, then that log is going to be log of 1. So that's going to be something that's going to be close to 0, and you'll be dividing by 0, which means your t is going to be enormous. So for t to be moderate, what you hope is that c be uh, significantly larger, uh, smaller than k. So what we what, what it means in terms of, of the spectral uh, uh, of spectral properties of that operator is that there is a spectral gap. So that gap means that the first and the second eigenvalues in terms of size are quite different, and the more different they are, in fact, the shorter that t it will be. And, and what it means in, in terms of the graph is that you will travel uh, uh, you will you will travel very fast from A to B and and a random walk a very short random walk will take you anywhere uniformly at random in the graph if there is a large spectral gap okay so now the question is is it the case for the class group so the eigenvalue the eigenfunctions are essentially uh, characters okay that's for any finite group and in particular in the class group. And the eigenvalues of a character, the eigenvalue, sorry, attached to a character is the sum of uh, chi of p plus chi of p inverse because of the, the, the shape of s that we chose, okay? So all of the um, uh, p's and their inverses of norm less than a certain bound that is essentially two plus epsilon. And it's proved by uh, uh, Zhao, Miller, and Finketesen that uh, uh, under a generalization of the Riemann hypothesis, we can show that the, um, uh, the, 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 the not, all the non-trivial eigenvalues are bounded by essentially a square root of the trivial eigenvalue. So that creates a gap, okay? That's, that's exactly the spectral gap that we want, okay? The, the, the non-trivial eigenvalues are at most essentially a square root of the trivial one, so that will make that quotient large enough for for uh, these this trip this travel the you know this this random walks to be short enough and still guarantee uh, good mixing properties. So in fact, what it means is when our uh, random walk has a length that essentially a uh, of log delta over log log delta, then we end in any s zero of probability at least 
uh, a half of the uniform probability, okay? So that, that is really what we wanted, and those walks are of moderate size, so that allows uh, some uh, computational problems to be solved efficiently. So what we've seen here is some, a very powerful tool to use in our uh, computational, in the solutions to our computational problems in the class group, but also in connection to traveling in the isogeny graph of a, uh, an ordinary elliptic curve or a super single elliptic curve defined over FP. So in the future lectures, we'll be using it in particular for classical computation. Thank you for your attention.